a warm welcome to our audience and also to our speakers from here in Suva, Fiji. I'm Shalendra Singh from the University of the South Pacific Media and Journalism Program, and I'll be chairing our session today. So far, we've had a really interesting conference, very, very exciting papers, some very insightful presentations, and we all look forward to your submissions. We have, so this, our, our section or our topic is legal, business, environment, politics, economics, and health in relation to indenture, old and new. And we have seven presenters today, namely, and this is in order of presentation. Uh, we have Ivy Hendik, who's a researcher and a scholar. Arshi Dua from Jawaharlal University. S. Singh Somra from the University of California, Santa Cruz. We have Selvan Naidu. Amita Esther David from the Solomon Islands National University. And finally, Jared Gillis from, Uni from Reunion Island. So we will start our presentations in that order, but just before that, a reminder of the ground rules. As usual, each speaker is allocated 15 minutes, and I will issue an alert after 13 minutes. Once the time is up, I will have to stop in and stop the session. Uh, during the session, the audience can send questions in the chat box, preferably with the name of the speakers that the question is directed to. After the full session, you can ask questions as well in person by raising the virtual hand. Um, and this is at the end of the session. Okay, so we're all ready to start now and I'll give the floor to the first speaker, Aidi Hendik. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is from the Center for African Studies. I'm a research scholar from Center for African Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, so, so my topic for presentation today is migration from Ethiopia to the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East started in the 1980s. and had increased significantly in the recent Slavery Index Africa Regional Report. Many individuals suffering chronic hunger, poverty. East African migrants, including the Ethiopians, as noted in the Global Slavery Index Africa Regional Report, many individuals suffering chronic hunger, poverty, and violence leave their home countries in search of work overseas. East African migrants, including Ethiopians, travel to the Middle East for employment as low-skilled domestic workers, cleaners, laborers, and construction workers. In 2013, Saudi Arabia expelled more than 100,000 Ethiopian migrants as part of a violent crackdown on illegal migrant workers. In reaction to this, the Ethiopian government banned the work-related migration of its citizens to all Gulf states. During this period, it is estimated that roughly 1,000 Ethiopian women were leaving the country each day to seek domestic work abroad, with Saudi Arabia the most common destination. In March 2017, the Saudi government launched another hardline campaign, granting all irregular migrants an amnesty period of 90 days to leave the country without being penalized. Since then, an estimated 2,60,000 Ethiopians have returned home according to the data from the International Organization for Migration. But in 2018, the Ethiopian government lifted the ban on overseas migration. The new legislation aims to protect its citizens from ill treatment by establishing regulations for recruitment agencies, minimum age requirements, a minimum level of education and training for migrant workers before the departure. But one issue is that it is challenging uh, to ensure licensed recruitment agencies operate ethically. It is particularly challenging for the uh, Ethiopian government 
to oversee this in destination countries where regulations and monitoring are often lacking. Also, uh, many Ethiopians are likely to fail to meet the requirements of the, this new legislation. If they then choose to migrate anyway, they could be rendered even more vulnerable to trafficking and exploitation. Uh, also, a broader concern is how persistent corruption and a lack of resources and expertise will affect the implementation of the new law. Um, it will be critical for Ethiopia to work with destination countries to ensure workers and protected from exploitation when they arrive. Ethiopia took the critical step of uh, implementing new labor agreements with Saudi Arabia in 2017 and the United Arab Emirates in 2018. Uh, these agreements contain protections for workers, which will hopefully benefit the thousands of Ethiopian women who still travel to the Middle East in search of work each week. Uh, also, migration laws have changed in Ethiopia, but labor migrants traveling overseas are still at the risk of modern slavery. Uh, the situation needs to be monitored closely, as was noted at a workshop hosted by Walk Free and Retrack Ethiopia in 2019 in Addis Ababa. Also, as the Ethiopian population is dominated uh, by the young people, and uh, there is also a high degree uh, of youth unemployment, both in the rural as well as in the urban areas, International uh, migration could be considered as a safety valve and would tend to continue in the coming years. Workshop participants also noted that Ethiopia's move to lift the migration ban was a step in the right direction for the country. However, uh, also the need for further analysis and effective regulation was also emphasized. Uh, this scrutiny will protect vulnerable citizens from the risk of trafficking and exploitation when they leave Ethiopia in search of a better life. So recognizing the numerous decent work deficits faced uh, by the Ethiopian migrants in the Middle East and the uh, ambit of improving the labor migration governance and also strengthening the protection of migrant workers' rights by making regular labor migration more accessible and desirable uh, the International Labor Organization has developed a project entitled Improved Labor Migration Governance to Protect Migrant Workers and Combat Irregular Migration in Ethiopia, uh, which was funded by the United Kingdom's Department for International Development. Uh, the project aims at supporting the efforts of the government and civil societies to address and reduce uh, irregular migration by improving labor migration governance uh, and also making regular labor migration more accessible and desirable to potential migrants in Ethiopia. That's all from my side. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ivy. That was a really good overview about the very serious plight of the powerless Ethiopian migrants, especially desperate Ethiopian women. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next speaker Thank on you, our list is, yeah, sure. The next speaker on our list is Arshi Dua. I believe she's from Jawaharlal University. Arshi, you may take the platform. Um, so since my presentation was recorded, shall I have to give it again or the recording would be viewed? You can give us maybe a 10 minute overview of your presentation and that, is a, that will perhaps allow us to have some discussions later on. Is it called, okay. can you do that for us? Yeah, sure, so I have, don't mind. Um, Go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'll be presenting my presentation on Indian migration to East Africa, old and new forms of indenture. Um, Indian diaspora has been an important aspect of East African history and culture. Indian uh, settlers in East Africa, referred in a ge very generic terms as Asian settlers, um, are Asian settlers in the region. Indian diaspora in Africa as a whole is very vast and unique. African continent has played host to Indian settlers for multiple generations, either voluntarily or through forced circumstances. 
Indians first came to Africa as merchants and traders who were more interested in trade and economic ties with Africa. A few of those merchants and traders also settled here later on. A major part of the Indian migration to the African region came during the colonial times. They came as slaves and indentured labor and settled in, then settled in various parts of Africa. Asian men first landed here, um, in East African region and were later followed by their women. Uh, the settlers wanted their children to prosper in their adopted country, but at the same time, they preferred to adopt uh, Indian, Indian values and culture and marry other Indians and as they, have a, as they share a common culture. In other words, many South Asians tended to reproduce their cultural values, language, and religion there. They came to the region initially as traders, merchants, and established business and trade ties with the East African region. This um, enabled the establishment of the diasporic community in the region. Uh, the colonial phase saw the indentured system coming to force with the abolition of slavery. In uh, abolition of slavery, an indentured labor or uh, a system of a bonded labor, which instituted uh, a bonded labor, wherein an indentured laborer is an employee with a system um, of unfree labor bound by or signed contract. Uh, signed or forced contract to work for a particular employer for a fixed time. Uh, the Indian workers were recruited uh, by the Britishers as indentured workers to work on the sugar, cotton, tea plantations in East African region, and most importantly on the railway construction projects in um, the colony, especially, especially in the East African area. The Indian journey in East Africa escalated when the Indians Especially the Sikhs from Punjab and Gujaratis from Gujarat signed a three year indentured contract under the British colonial rule to build in the railway line starting from Mombasa to Uganda. This thus opened gates for other Indians, uh, merchants, artisans, and watchmen to come and settle in the region. Uh, the colonial rule in the East Africa, East Africa gained prominence due to its a very striking feature of compartmentalizing the society into racial groups, as well as reinforcing the segregation via social, economic, and political discriminations and practices. Such a compartmentalizing feature of the colonial rule suited the Asian temperament to the T. They were conservative community and therefore very glad to be left alone to pursue their own interests, their goals, uh, traditional ways of thinking, and have their own culture. However, such a segregation also laid down to uh, anti-Asian sentiments in the region and especially on, among the uh, native African population as they considered the Asian policy of isolation as apathy where they own, uh, uh, in comparison to their own culture and tradition. The H, um, Asians had a very positive influence also where they introduced free flowing cash and also they acted as a middleman in the colonial civil services department. They were actually a true part of the colonial, part and parcel of the colonial landscape. The colonial phase saw a strange triangular relationship between the Indian diaspora, the native Africans, and the European imperialists. During this phase, the Asians were not only seen as individuals by, uh, were not seen as individuals by either of the two, be it the native Africans or the European counterparts. They were mistrusted by Africans as being pro-Europeans, and they were and, they, and the Europeans had a very preconceived, stereotypical image of the Asians in the not only East African region but on a global level as well. Um, according to Neera Tapur Romson in her book, Jalem to Tanna, um, where she stated, no matter which caste he belonged to, a Brahmin or an untouchable, an Indian was always a Kuli, Dukawala, or at the best, a Babu. Whereas for Yasmin Alivai Brown in her book, The Settler's Cookbook, uh, the despised faction by all was the Brown. Such statements and thoughts reflect the colonial circumstances of the Indian diaspora community in the East African region. Furthermore, due to their economic control over finances, and uh, they were criticized by the Africans, and due to the racial policies of the British, they were considered only a small step above the natives and were seen as a middleman. Um, such a situation created uh, uh, mistrust and disparity as well as the anti-Asian sentiment uh, in the region. The post-colonial phase uh, much saw a much changed East Africa. It was a time for the anti-Asian slogans and sentiments that rose in the political and social scenarios, and were, there was ruthless violence in the in its interaction with the diasporic community. This phase saw the Kenyanization policy applied by Kenyatta primarily on the pro-African policies and against Asians living there. Furthermore, the, um, the exodus and the atrocities applied by President Idi Amin in Uganda also 
um, attributed towards such a sentiment in the region. Idi Amin on 5th August 1972 gave his famous Asian farewell speech wherein said, the Asians had 90 days to pack up their belongings and find another home. His main argument was they came to Uganda to build in the country's railway, but they should leave now as the work of it is now complete. Furthermore, he accused them of having a, of economic sabotage and unwilling to invest in the African growth and development. Such instances reflect deep-rooted resentments among the native Africans regarding the Asian population living there. And that's a, it is a consequence of the colonial mindset and the policies adopted under the colonial rule. Overall, the political and social atmosphere during the late 1960s and 70s was tense turbulence, which resulted in the exile of almost all Asians living in the region. However, the exile was followed by multiple crimes like rapes, molestations, demeaning, um, abuse against women of the Asian community, looting, ransacking of properties, business, was also a part and parcel of this phase. Uh, following this uh, turbulent times, the 1982, uh, with the Kenyan coup, uh, to, uh, in an attempt to remove President Moy, many Asian shops and businesses in Nairobi were attacked and pillaged. Despite fears of the time, however, a coup did not, uh, however, uh, the exodus of the Asians did not happen again at that time. After the expulsion the, of the Asian community from Uganda, the economy of the region overall also collapsed. There was an increased debt crisis. Uh, there was a pressure from World Bank. Such a situation was common in the entire East African region. The situation was so dire that in the early 1990s, so the call by the governments of these regions to bring back the Asian population so that the balance of the region can be restored. The returning Asian population had brought about investments and employment opportunities to the region. And another aspect was there was a lot of free flowing cash investment um, happening because of the uh, coming back of the Asian. Uh, as a result, which the decade of 1990s witnessed the efforts made by the government in the region to stabilize the economy of the region. The 2000s saw a new wave of the Indian migration to the region due to um, new employment opportunities. In the contemporary times, Indians voluntarily go to the East African region to in search for jobs and monetary opportunities. With the expansion of the Indian companies and diaspora in the region, like Bharti Airtel, Mahindra and Mahindra, Mehka Group, Madhwani Group, the Indian population uh, find a relatively familiar environment there, which in turn result in the migration of the Indian population to the East Africa. It's, it's also another popular hotspot in search for work and employment opportunities. During the 2000s, the multinational Indian firms also began to um, expand the investments in Uganda. Tata Uganda Limited, which, which engages in the important sale of motor vehicles and motor vehicles and pharmaceuticals is one such example. These new firms employ Indian expatriate labor for further level management, as well as Indian employees for semi-skilled management, uh, semi-skilled labor such as management, accounting, IT, etc. Firms in Uganda and other East African nations often seek employees uh, from the web, uh, from Indian websites like the monster.com and the notary.com to hire chartered accountants and other skilled professionals. The returning Ugandan Asian families, um, and of course the returning um, Exodus families who return to the region often uh, follow the same suit and seek Indian laborers through these similar employment sites. The new construction, um, the new forms of Asian employers in the region is much more different from the earlier late 80s uh, employers as a result uh, of the previous eras. They are more suited towards, uh, they're more progressive and modern and cosmopolitan of securing the region as a whole. Um, another positive element in the current time is that in, on uh, 22nd July 2017, Uru Kenyatta government announced that the Asian community would be officially recognized as the 44th tribe in Kenya due to the uh, uh, community's uh, contribution in Kenya from the dawn of the nation. Such sentiments further attributes towards migration of the Indian laborers towards the region. The positive elements slowly coming in the relations with, um, with the governments also enable the migration of the Indian population uh, to the region in search for work, employment opportunities, and a better standard of living, specifically um, if they want to change an environment as compared to the other parts of the world. Uh, in 2019, the Kenyan census, uh, Kenyan census recorded 47,555 Kenyan citizens of Asian origin um, living in Kenya while um, uh, with the uh, Asian origin, while 
uh, roughly around 42,972 individuals uh, of Asian origin were living without the Kenyan citizens, a citizenship in India, uh, in uh, Kenya. Thus, to conclude, I would say that the East African nation, uh, East African region, has witnessed indentured slavery contract under the colonial government, and in the contemporary times. Modern self-migration of um, the Indian uh, Indians and Indian diaspora to the region for better opportunities and experiences. They have seen an evolution from an old form of indenture to a modern new form of indenture, wherein they themselves freely go to the region, um, as you call it, a self-indentured, and sign the contract to work in the region. Uh, sign the contract in the region. Thus, it can be stated that with time, the reasons of migration of Indians to East Africa have evolved. The forms of indentured have transformed from forced indentured to self-contractual work and new employment opportunities and experiences. In my paper, overall, thus I've tried to analyze this shift from an old forms of indentured to a modern new forms of indentured. In the, to, from uh, indentured and migration for or the Indian diaspora from um, uh, towards the East African nation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. A most interesting presentation. Uh, Arshi, uh, you have updated us about brethren in East Africa. We don't really hear much about them in this part of the world, including how they were sandwiched between native Africans and also the colonialists. Very interesting presentation. Well done. Thank you, sir. So next, you, sir. our next speaker is S. Singh Somra. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Somra, you may go ahead. Namaskar. I am very much thankful to organizers of uh, this conference on an old and new indenture labor practices and human rights. I am particularly thankful to Dr. Farjana and Dr. Narendra Prasad, who always encouraged me to associate the Hadith Association. Really, I am thankful for both because I have learned a lot through the venture. Basically, my talk is on multidimensional aspects of Indian diaspora migration. In this uh, talk, I have tried to analyze the various aspects of Indian old and new diaspora. They are related with their dynamism, their individual growth, and contribution in both the host and their origin country. So from introduction point of view, as we know, the origin of the Indian uh, diaspora has always been the regional social structures of the immigrants and migrants. The importance of migration and culture to migration research and policy making is reflected in the work of the United Nations University Migration Network. Culture is a key consideration in discussion around regional integration and regional connections. It is also an important factor in terms of health and other social policy areas affecting migrants. Two states of mind are often used to understand the history of the Indian diaspora, the old and the new, all refers to the large scale migration of workers and their descendants under the indentured system of the 19th century. The word Girmit has a special place uh, in the plantation life experience in the context of the old diaspora of India. And another side, the contemporary globalization that is the compression of time and space and the revolution in communication and technology have accelerated the network and the flow of people, capital, knowledge, and media, which are now no more limited by the nation's boundaries, have led to the emergence of globalize, globalizing and traditional network. So uh, to keep it this background as uh, an introduction part, uh, what is the multi-dynamic or multi-dimensional aspects? So the Indian uh, diaspora of the 21st century is the result of the emergence of the old and new diaspora. Indians in the diaspora have fought hard to preserve their identity with this skill and creativity. While adjusting to their host communities and local conditions, the emergence of the Indian diaspora gives evidence of various dimensions in the maintenance of Indian languages, religious values, and cultural values. It is uh, because of these uh, efforts of conservation and adaption that the Indian diaspora is emerging as an important force representing India in the current global cultural diversity. The migration of people uh, from the Indian subcontinent to different countries took place in different periods of history for different 
regions, the regions where people migrate are many and are often complex. And uh, interrelated, these are commonly understood as push and pull factors. The push factors may include underemployment, unemployment, low wages, or lack of secure livelihood, or high levels of uh, vulnerability or uh, environmental degradation or the risk of environmental disaster, such as uh, severe feeding or drought, the high cost of consumer goods, and the threat or actual presence of violence or other form of political or social insecurity. Meanwhile, full factors may include the demand for workers, more opportunities and stages of employment, higher wages in destination countries, relatively higher levels of uh, political or social security, and uh, better circumstances in general for a comparatively improved quality of life. In a positive way, the country of origin and the country of destination benefit from migration as do the migrants themselves, but unfortunately, they are without risk and cost. In common, all the important factors which motivate people to move can be classified as economic, demographic, social, cultural, political, and miscellaneous factors. There, there has been a continuous global migration of various groups from India in search of religious, cultural propagations, commercial entrepreneurship, and opportunities. So from dynamic and vibrant point of view, you know, India has uh, been experiencing large scale migration to foreign countries in centuries and in current globalized era. The report uh, International Migration 2020 highlights by the United Nations has said the Indian diaspora, one of the most vibrant and dynamic uh, is the largest in the world. It is also considered as a catalyst for economic development in India and host countries. The Indian diaspora that is spread over more than 134 countries in the world. The largest export community in the world, nearly 80 million Indians are living outside their homeland. Indians migrants in Gulf Cooperation Council countries alone generated remittances worth $40 billion in 2018. India has also retained its position as the largest recipient of remittance money transfer from non-resident Indians and the people of Indian origin employed outside the country to family, friends, and relatives living in India. So diaspora can play an important role in economic development of their countries of origin beyond their well-known role as centers of remittance. Diaspora can also promote trade and foreign direct investment, create businesses and support entrepreneurship and transfer new knowledge and skills. The country had received uh, $83.3 billion in remittance in 2019. Uh, that was highest in the world. During the corona crisis, when India was battling a once in a century crisis in the form of the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic, two aid groups in US led by people of Indian origin. In the US led by people of Indian origin raised more than 25 million dollars towards assisting the country stand health system. In the UK, three Hindu temples raised more than six lakh pounds. Sikh similarly donated 700 to 2000 dollars to each of dozens of people in need of oxygen cylinders back home. For decades now, India's large and vibrant uh, Diaspora has been leveraging its wealth, political clout, and expertise to stay the country economically seamlessly integrating with the countries of their adoption. The United Nations University Migration Network considers questions of migration and development. It also produces research that is relevant to diaspora for achieving the sustainable development goals. So development is examined by the network is a complex and multifaceted concept involving cultural, political, and social elements. It addressing this focus area considers how migration in rich societies and how vulnerabilities for mobility affecting cultural, political, economic, and social development. So in contemporary times, enhancing India India soft power policy, Indian diaspora is one of the richest minority in many developed countries, also many people of Indian origin hold top political positions in many countries, which enhance Indian, India's political plot is a multilateral institution like the United Nations, in which our 
part of the world indians went they not only retained their indianness but also integrated the lifestyle of that nation prime minister of india had said in 2018 at the pravasi bharatiya divas the government run convention for expatriate outreach he called the diaspora true and true and permanent ambassador of the country apart from promoting and upholding the rich indian culture and interest on foreign lands the diaspora has also emerged as a soft power asset in new delhi scheme of things yoga has contributed uh, uh, proactively towards bolestering india's image as a spiritual superpower in the united nations announced june 21st as the international day of yoga mass yoga practices in the awareness come have become prevalent across the global capitals with the indian uh, missions proactively promoting and promoting the ancient uh, science that uh, integrate physical and spiritual disciplines indian yoga instructors and the practitioners abroad have played a key role over decades in popularizing uh, and the indian uh, the ancient practice abroad the story of uh, kamla harris ascending to the vice presidency also emerged simultaneously with the rise in her popularity among the large indian diaspora in the us which proudly embraced her tamil roots similarly the ancestors of uh, morrison prime minister parvin son of uh, former pm anirudh had migrated to the island nations from the indian state of uttar pradesh while the south american country of suriname has indian origin chandrika prasad uh, santoki is its president silicon valley the home of several uh, big uh, innovative us tech companies now hosts the highest concentration of indian americans from google uh, sundar pichai to microsoft satyan nandela and uh, adobe uh, Santunu Narayan. So, Indian Americans have risen up to occupy the high positions at global uh, tech companies and continue to take uh, huge strides in the banking, finance, education, and other sectors too. Even Professor Narayan Prasad, ILO, and Dr. Farzan Adi, IPU New Zealand, and Dr. Prem Nath Gupta, Srinidad, etc., uh, also have a successful story of an uh, old Indian diaspora. So one of the richest minorities in many developed countries, the Indian diaspora has on several occasions helped in uh, lobbying for favorable terms regarding New Delhi interest uh, and uh, exercising uh, greater control over policy making. The presence of our 9 million experts uh, across the several Gulf states has also helped India in addressing its global image amid new daily growing strategic interest in west asia indian nationals also make up the gulf states largest expatriate community putting the diaspora at the center of immigration and labor policy making so the increase in the popularity of indian films among the indian diaspora community has also contributed to uh, rekindling indianness among this demographic these cultural exports money offices are increasingly portraying the diasporic indian life uh, as a medium to explore a common bond among the strangers in uh, another country as india enters her 75th years of independence the indian diaspora role is a catalyst for economic and social development both in the host country and uh, the country of birth remains uh, not worthy and the largest transnational population is not just keeping the indians values within it alive but also constituting the cog in the wheels so of india's progress from all the corners of the world so in conclusion migration is a complex phenomenon that touches on a multiplicity of economic social security aspects affecting our daily lives in an increasingly interconnected world migration is a term that encompasses a wide variety of uh, moments and situations involving people of all walk of life and backgrounds more than uh, even uh, before migration touches all its states and people in an uh, era of uh, different globalization migration is intertwined with the geopolitics uh, trade and cultural acting and provide the opportunities for its states businesses and communities to benefit enormously migration has helped improve people lives in both foreign and destination countries and has offered opportunities for millions of people worldwide 
to hold safe and meaningful life abroad. So the diaspora can step up and act as the Indian ambassador says it is insufficient and ineffective for a country for its missions abroad to reply on UN press release to change public opinion. The diaspora can provide the weakness of strategic impulse which makes it all the more important to unlock their potential. The present government is writing their focus on the diaspora as they are a strategic asset to India. Thank you. Thank you. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Somra, for your most interesting analysis of the various points in the history of Indian migration and how this huge dynamic diaspora is a force to be reckoned with. So apart from the vice president of the US, Nikki Haley might be running for presidency very soon. So that might be another achievement. Most interesting presentation, thank you. Our next speaker is Selvan Naidu. Okay, Selvan Naidu is okay. in the room, I invite him. Yes, thank you so much. and. Uh... It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, is my video going to be shared or must I do the live presentation? You can do a live presentation, uh, Selvan. You do a, a live okay, I'm just going to share my uh, PowerPoint. So just give me a minute to get started. Okay, is, uh, I just want a heads up as to whether the uh, um, slideshow is visible. I can see it. I'm sure the others okay. can see it as well. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to shift my screens and so on so that I'll be able to see things and let's get going. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, um, good day, wherever you may be. Um, uh, on behalf of the 1860 Heritage Centre, uh, myself, I'd like to thank the organisers um, for giving us the opportunity to present on a topic that is very under-researched throughout the uh, diaspora in terms of indenture. I'd also like to thank the organizers and the um, sponsors, particularly uh, uh, Dr. Frazana Gounden for giving us this opportunity. Um, my topic uh, is on child labor during the system of indentured labor to South Africa between the years 1860 to 1911, 1960, sorry. Um, the revision, documentation, and teaching of marginalized history is crucial to the forging of a collective national identity in post-apartheid South Africa. And you would have seen with the unrest in the last few years that um, our identity as South Africans is under threat. So clearly, indenture studies forms a huge part of it, and we want to see it as part of the collective. So detailed studies of this wide-ranging topic uh, of indentured worker history remains inadequate in many facets, simply because of uh, where we've come from in terms of apartheid. One of the foremost scholars on indenture, this is uh, in South Africa, the late Professor Sarendra Bana, who um, did the uh, study on the ship's list, and he did it between the years 1860 to 19, um, 1910, sorry, 1907. So it wasn't a complete one, which includes up to 1911. He spoke of 75 linear meters of archival material that lies in weight of further research at the Peter Maritzburg archives. The Peter Maritzburg archives are, are in KwaZulu and Natal, and this is where all these um, uh, documents are stored. The sheer volume of work, as he had pointed out, um, you know, points to many gaps that exist in the, in the fields of indenture studies that await serious scholarly attention. One of these gaps points to the socio-historical location of children in the system of indenture. Sumita Mukherjee, uh, one of the few people that have written on child migrant um, labor in indenture, uh, points that there's a huge scope that lies within the archives and in the field to explore the Indian child migrant as a historical subject in its own right. Here in South Africa, there were 384 ships that trans transported uh, workers, 62% were men, 25% were women, and children constituted 13% of the total of 152,000 that arrived between 1860 and 1911. Children were clearly firmly entrenched as a vital part of this labor provision mechanism 
during the system of indenture. So where is this evidence and how do we validate child labor in the system of indenture here in South Africa? One particular example that's cited as far as the um, uh, records are concerned, and this is also cited by a phenomenal book by Professor Ashwin Desa and Gulam Fayed in their book called Inside Indenture. Here we have passenger number 122 on board the Mvoti in 1882, 16 year old Munyama was recorded to have committed suicide on the official captain's logbook. Upon further investigation, and simply because of the testimony of a fellow passenger, in this case, Andy Sinan, uh, it suggests that the sailors were actually responsible for Munyama's death um, in, in that she was thrown overboard. So Munyama's death on board the, the voyage of this particular voyage just highlights one case of the abuse of children during the voyages. Um, beyond the archives, and this is a sensational find, which we need to unpack in a, in a more detailed paper, in a break from conventional agency and local archival, archival material, Stuart Furburn of Sydney posted images on Facebook. And he had drawn this from the diaries and clippings of his grandfather, Max de Kruter. Max de Kruter had captained indenture ships uh, for, for a number of years. And so his diary and the pictures that uh, the grandson had posted that were, that were in the possession of Max de Kruter starts giving us fresh insight into the events of these journeys. And in one particular diary entry, it talk, talks to how children became part of the system. Uh, here, where it's, this is, this is de Kruter's diary, he speaks about, it also happened that children were born during the voyage of indenture. Um, each new arrival meant that there was an extra gratuity for the doctor, the master, the officers, the bonus being calculated on the number of souls landed and not embarked. Here, we just start seeing the commodification of children. This is this picture that you know, is sensational in terms of breaking with agency. Um, it's an incredible picture because in South Africa, we don't have the individual photos of the 152,000 people between 1860 and 1911. That's lost somewhere, possibly in one of the museums. And, but this picture uh, aboard this SS Umona uh, in 1903, once we start looking at the ship's list, we start, start identifying you know, character traits that will be able to identify where certain people had come from and so on, grandmothers and grandfathers and so on. And this is the conditions in which people were brought over. So it's something that is unpublished and is very rare in terms of its find. Abuse on arrival. During the first phase of indenture to until colonial planters paid seven pounds per adult and three, three pounds, 10 shillings per child. On board the first ship, ship the Truro, there was this individual 34 year old Orquim who was accompanied by her daughters, eight year old Migliama, and Susanna, the names were very poorly spelled. So, you know, this is from the official records, the ship's list. So you'll notice that uh, because they were badly captured, they, they, they were badly uh, recorded as well. But clearly, you know, these weren't the, the, the full spellings of them. But in this particular case, this family, uh, the mother and the two children were assigned to Gray's Hospital to work. A year, a year later, both children were assigned to different colonial employees. And in this instance, although the law prohibited the assignment of children under 10, clearly this wasn't the case. Sadly, the mother, Rokium, died three years later. Uh, what became of Migliema and Susanna, both orphaned at the age of 12, is consigned to history as yet another family wrecked by the system of indenture. This is the first cohort of the ship's analysis. And, and the reason for this is that it starts to show you and break down the, the child, and we define child here between the ages of naught to 18. But this is the first, first cohort of the 15,000. Um, and this is the first Excel spreadsheets that, spreadsheet that exists today. So between, the, bet, between an infant age, there were 934. This is between naught and three. Preschool going children, 824. School going, 635. Teenagers, um, 1,205. And this equates to 24% of this first cohort. In the bigger paper, I'll present the whole lot of uh, between 100, sorry, the 152,000 that will give us numbers 
in terms of this particular breakdown. Archival complaints, Henry Pollock, a close uh, friend of uh, Gandhi, was determined to expose the system, the evil system of indenture. His only reference to child labor was in the tea factories. And this is where ch children were used extensively. They worked as much as 11 hours per week. The law laid down that women too were to be paid half the wages and minors in proportion. The boy, a boy's wage could vary from five shillings, um, five to nine shillings per month with an increase of one shilling per month per, per annum. Thus the boy would receive two pennies for nine hours of work per day. This is a, a very good example of uh, children being involved um, in the system of indenture. Here we see children barely in their teens required to earn their keep on the uh, Mount Edgecombe Estates. The Mount Edgecombe Estates is um, probably about 20 kilometers away from the city of Durban. And it's really the seat of indentured labor in uh, South Africa. Um, boys here work the same hours as men, but for considerably lower wages. The Hewlett's factory out in uh, Northern Natal, close to Stanger and Kersney, were notorious for the use of children. And, and because of the tea plantations, they needed dexterity of small hands and nimble fingers, which were required for picking tea leaves. Younger children were also put to work in light factory tasks, such as sweeping and so on. Yeah, perfect examples of children um, heavily involved in the system of, uh, or the mechanism of labor provision. A, a, a haunting picture of a young girl working in the Hewlett's plantations, tea plantations out in Stanger, in the north uh, of Durban. Oral interviews, and here I must pause to actually uh, acknowledge the work of Professor uh, Surendra Bana and uh, Professor Uma Dupelia Mestri. These were assignments done by students in the 1980s and uh, Professor Bana and um, Professor Uma Dupelia Mestri, at that time she was a lecturer, they, they, they guided this particular project. So it provided phenomenal insight in terms of oral testimonies. In one particular case, this is a painful story of Parasaraman Amavasai. Parasaraman arrived in 1907 with his parents as an infant, and he was accompanied by his five-year-old sister. At the age of 12, Parasaraman started work as a field laborer. So by 12 years, you know, children were fully involved in the system of labor provision, and he earned two shillings per month. The saddest, saddest part about Parasaraman and his life was that he worked for this company, the Reynolds Brothers, who were the, were the most unkind and the way the most amount of abuse was, con was committed in their plantations. He worked for them for 53 years. And according to the company, they didn't have any record of him. They proceeded to pay him two rand for every year of service. And sadly, he died with no income, no extra income. And he died really penniless in his estate down in the South Coast. Here we see children. And if you look to the bottom left-hand corner, children are firmly part of the system of indenture and uh, here, this is payday out in the Bria in 1900. Child neglect, and this is also uh, quite horrendous cases as well. Here we, 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 we witnessed to the tragic case of the Robinsons um, and where they employed Mudali and his wife, Oda Nagi. Um, their elder child was two and a half year old, or years old and was tied to a pig the whole day while the children worked. When the second child was born to this couple less, year, less than a week old, the employer allowed the mother to bring the child to work, fearing that, well, the employer didn't allow, fearing that the child would starve, the mother gave the child away to foster parents, and sadly, the child died of neglect. Education was something that was uh, paltry for a number of years between, between 1869 and 1899, they were only, there was only primary school education being offered. The census of um, the census shows that um, there were 5% of Natal Indians who were literate in English. Um, 29 predominantly missionary schools, and these were poorly resourced. At this time, most parents uh, of school going children could not afford to send their children to school. So children um, were contributing to the family upkeep. These were the, the, the lucky few that were able to go to school. And you also see a hierarchy in terms of 
um, you know, the levels you see some children with school, with shoes and some without. So, you know, this, this was also uh, uh, an issue of contention in the earlier years as when education started. Psychological trauma, and this is really something that um, we need to bring more to attention to. Um, and perhaps the most extreme evidence of psychological trauma, trauma is the high suicide rates in the plantation. In reference to children of that list, uh, between 1880 and 1911, there were 14 children to have been listed. Of this figure, uh, five year old, there were five 18 year olds, three 17 year olds. Um, I can't see my screen, so let me just move that a bit. Two were 16 year olds, uh, two were 13 year olds, one was 12 years, and the youngest being 10 and a half year old. How a 10 and a half year old come with suicide is beyond me, but it's something that needs to be investigated and in terms of the actual uh, events around that. Excuse me. Just remind me of time as we go along. The sociological impact beyond indention, this is one of the focus of my paper that speaks to beyond indention, our child uh, labor continued. In this instance, children often accompanied parents to sell fresh produce and not just in Durban, but in Johannesburg as well, where many of the hawkers and traders had settled. Here we see children also themselves would be would take to small hawking small items and so on. Dry fish and the, the was the only source of pr uh, protein rations during indenture. And in this uh, small island uh, in the Bay of Durban, uh, which is called Salisbury, you see children that were uh, high in number. So these were free Indians post indenture. Uh, and in 1885, the total population was 218 free Indians. Of this, there were um, 86 children that inhabited the land. So obviously there were more children than there were adults in this particular instance. And as you see with the pictures, they were clearly part of the working environment. Children were also involved in other employment uh, beyond indenture. And when uh, the con contracts started to expire, they found they they way towards the urban environments. And one of the uh, employment opportunities, I won't call it an opportunity, but in this case here, yeah, it's an abuse, simply because of children, as you see with this picture, working in um, the hotel industry. And this is out in a tea room in Mitchell Park in the early 1900s. Missionary Sarah, played an important part. Yes. I'm pardon me, Sarah, we, have, we have two more minutes. Okay, great. I should be able to finish off. Um, so in terms of uh, childcare and missionary, missionary was very important um, during the Gandhi years and, um, and, and particularly at this time, there were missionaries that were really concerned with overcrowding, living conditions, um, high child and uh, maternal mortality. And there were high incidence of disease and so on and a widespread illiteracy, uh, specifically among children. And there was sterling work that was done by the missionaries in being able to prevent high infant Indian death at this, at this particular time. So they were trained midwives, in this case here, we call them ayahs or bag ladies, and Sister Frances played an important role in the training. Here you see Sister Frances in the center. The missionary work that you see, uh, an orphaned, orphan, orphanage as you see on the top left-hand corner, Social welfare, there were two institutes, namely the Arun Benevolent Home and the Durban Indian Welfare, uh, Child Welfare. They had to take care of children simply because um, children of color were denied uh, by the borough of Durban and um, the government at that particular time. This is uh, the, the Arun Benevolent Home years later, 1933. They were formed in 1921. And this, this building doesn't exist any longer. They do exist now in Chatsworth. Milk, the provision of uh, milk for nutrition towards the mid-century, Cape Town Agreement, I'll wrap up very quickly, which meant that there was uh, poor education. There was a fight for um, secondary schools in 1941 um, by the Natal Indian Congress because of uh, the poor resources with regard to education. Children that were denied, this was an, uh, a young child, but clearly had adult responsibilities as you see with the dummy. This was a beautiful expose done in 1957 
as late as that. Um, and it was beautifully captured by Ranjit Kali. And here you see children um, younger than 10 years in some instances working, still working in the sugarcane plantations. Children preparing sugarcane. So, you know, it's still continued up to the 60s, uh, obviously in smaller numbers. And in conclusion, you know, I want to probably look at my last bullet because of time, but in rising to Professor Barner's challenge, as I pointed out earlier, there must be more research that's undertaken with regard to centralizing the Indian child migrant as a historical subject in its own right. Thank you for that and uh, apologies for going over time. Thank you. So Selvan Naidu's presentation was not only disturbing, but also unique, if not rare in this conference, in terms of highlighting child labor and exploitation in indenture. And you know, after your presentation, we realized that children are perhaps the forgotten or underappreciated victims of indenture. And as you say, definitely we need more research in this area. We can see South Africa, they are doing some work in this area, but I'm not too sure about the other countries. So thank you for that, Selvan. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next speaker is Amita Esther David from the Solomon Islands National University. Greetings from India to you, sir, my fellow panelists and friends. I'm grateful to Dr. Farzana Gounder and the organizers and sponsors of this conference for giving me a chance to present my paper. Uh, my paper is entitled The Pandemic, Lessons from the Past and the Need to Remember Our Loss. India was home to many epidemics like leprosy, tuberculosis, cholera, smallpox, diphtheria, etc. Uh, while <clears throat> cholera, malaria, influenza, diarrhea, um, etc. were regular visitors in the Fiji Islands. I wish to talk about the missionary activities in both colonies before moving on to the Spanish flu and the attitude of the British government and the need to remember our loss. Uh, the Charter Act of 1813 did not favor missionaries uh, and their activities in India. Nevertheless, after 1857, scores of missionaries came to India and uh, they excelled in their healing missions. And uh, I've just given a sample of few of the hospitals that were opened by the missionaries. They set up educational institutions, dispensaries, asylums, sanatoriums and hospitals all over India. And many of the missionary doctors were even awarded the Kaiser Hin medals for their selfless and devoted service during the various plagues and epidemic outbreaks. Uh, the 1896 plague that uh, came by a ship from Hong Kong. And initially, the government kept the city port open for business and underplayed the severity of the plague. The disease spread like wildfire in, a tightly, in the tightly packed slums of Bombay. And the children amused themselves by throwing dead rats in the gullies, and nearly 12 million people died in this place. The merchant class or the Baniyas were opposed to the killing of rats for religious reasons. And uh, at this point of time, the government turned to Hapkin, Waldemar Mordecai Hapkin, uh, to make a plague vaccine. He had already successfully tried and vaccinated uh, people for cholera in 1894 in Calcutta. So that is why he was asked to come and make start make the plague vaccine from scratch, which he did. And by the end of January 1897, thousands had been inoculated. In the meantime, the Epidemic Disease Act of 1897 was adopted and put into effect. Stringent measures were adopted by the government, which included house-to-house -house visitations by plague medical officers, inspection of the corpses, segregation camps, and segregation at hospital level. The people were forced to undergo medical inspection. Infected clothing were burnt and patients were given a disinfectant bath in wooden uh, tubs. But the most effective method against the plague was complete evacuation. And I'm moving on to the missionary activities in Fiji. The British took over Fiji in 1874, but the missionaries had already arrived in 1835 with the sole purpose of proselytization. The people were known to be savages, and it was left to the missionaries to tame them. By 1860, there was complete conversion of all islanders, even if only in name. The missionaries looked for holistic development by opening many schools for the local population, 
and providing them with Western education so that they could become economically self-reliant. For example, um, uh, the Ballantine School, which was opened by Mary Ballantine for the welfare and uplift of the girls of Itoki. Reverend William Slade was the first missionary to arrive in 1896 in Nailaga, and he opened the Mat Matervelo Girls School and the Wuniviti Boys School. Reverend Lorimer Fisher, Fishen and Reverend John Weir Burton, they were very concerned with the working conditions and the treatment of the islanders and also the indentured labor from India and other colonies. Burton in his book, uh, The Fiji of Today, which was published in 1910, he actually acquainted uh, Charles uh, Andrews about the plight of the Indian indentured labor in Fiji. And uh, it's after this that uh, Andrews comes to uh, the Fiji island and then there is this whole campaign against the uh, indentured labor. In January 1875, uh, Chief Kakabao and party, they were returning from Sydney via warship HMS Dido. He and his son got infected with measles. And since there was no quarantine procedure that had been established in Fiji, uh, the king, he was welcomed by a very large number of Fijians. And it was this human contact which actually helped spread the measles epidemic. And it wiped out nearly 140,000 people in Fiji along with many Wesleyan church ministers, nine native ministers, and 200 catechists. This was followed by whooping cough dengue century in the coming years. Uh, mission supplies of food and medicines, they were shared with some help from the local traders. And buildings that housed ailing colonists were burnt down. The Methodist missionary, George Brown and his wife Lydia, cared for many ailing people during many epidemics while suffering grave personal loss. They lost two of their children um, five months apart in an epidemic in 1879. Um, Governor George, uh, Governor Sir George O'Brien asked the Catholics and the Western missionaries to start a hygiene mission in Fiji because that was a pressing concern. Now, <clears throat> among the agents responsible for change, influenza was the only epidemic uh, which originated in the West and then it spread eastward. And uh, being highly contagious, it was spread through the troops returning from war in ships, and they passed on the infection to the rest of the population via railroad and obviously human contact. And there was a shortage of doctors as they were tending to the soldiers who were wounded at war. Now the Spanish flu in India was initially known as the Bombay fever. Uh, on 10th June, uh, 1918, seven sepoys on duty at the docks, they were admitted in the hospital. By 24th June 1918, the fever had almost spread like wildfire all over Bombay, which was an overcrowded industrial area with a large working class population living in poorly ventilated one room shawls or slums in poorly uh, uh, without or sans proper sanitary conditions. The symptoms included pain in limbs and bones, bronchial inflammation, pain and soreness in the eyes. The largest mortality was among the low-class Hindus and the people were mostly between the ages of 25 to 40 years and it uh, affected the women more. <clears throat> now, the reasons that were given for the high mortality rate for poverty, illiteracy, superstition, cramped and unhygienic living conditions, uh, and these were the causes for the spread of influenza. The health officer, Andrew Turner, he appealed to the people of uh, Mumbai, observing that uh, the ignorance and the superstition of the people and their different social backgrounds and modes of life made it difficult for the authorities uh, to spread the check of the disease. Lack of uh, proper food and medical care uh, made the industrial workers easy prey. The government rec recommended quarantine, opening up of ill-ventilated buildings, disinfection of clothing, sanitization drives, and evacuation, which of course was the best um, policy. Uh, there were some very famous personalities who were affected by this uh, epidemic. Uh, and they include Mahatma Gandhi, Charles Freer Andrews, uh, Munshi Premchand, and po the poet Nirala. Uh, Gandhiji lost his daughter-in-law and grandson to the food. Relief efforts were carried out 
throughout the length and breadth of India by the Christian missionaries and other secular organizations like the Salvation Army, the Indian Red Cross, Social Service League. There were about 250 odd social organizations that had come into help. Now moving to the attitude of the British officials. As a famine was raging, raging in the United Provinces, the Lieutenant Governor Sir Harcourt Butler spoke of the famine and the rising prices, but he failed to mention the plague of 1819 in his province, despite uh, having a mortality rate of 2 million. In Fiji um, or in the Pacific, the disease came from Auckland via a steamship saloon to Fiji, Western Samoa and Tonga. The Chief Medical Officer G.W.A. Lynch examined many crew members ailing uh, with flu. He, along with Dr. Paley, came to the conclusion that there was nothing serious about the cases and the people were allowed to disembark at Suva on 4th November 1918. The death of six Fijians and seven stevedores uh, forced the administration to finally acknowledge the presence of the epidemic on 18th November, which is almost after 14 days. It came to be known as the Badi Bimari in Fiji. The region of American Samoa suffered no death due to strict quarantine practice. However, in Western Samoa, which was under the British, no quarantine restrictions had been imposed because none had been received by Colonel Robert Logan. It was known as the Famai in Samoa. Uh, in Tonga, the only medical doctor had gone to collect medical supplies in Fiji and he stayed on in Fiji to help the Fijians uh, combat the epidemic without realizing that Tonga too was affected. The response of the government, uh, the nursing skills of the Europeans were welcomed, uh, though besides quinine and Epsom salts, there was little to offer. In Fiji, gargling with hot water and salt was advised with an emphasis on cleanliness. European food was thought to be better in terms of its recuperative part, thereby emphasizing European food supremacy. The government's answer to influenza was quarantine, bed rest, and aspirin for fever, but neither claimed nor guaranteed survival. Masks were offered only to the Europeans and inhalations to European and Indian laborers on select plantations. The troops were lauded for the heroic work of maintaining law and order. Here I'd like to add that uh, the, uh, the men among the indentured labor, the men were actually valued for their work. And so uh, the planters were very, very careful and they actually, you know, ensured that nothing happened to the men. Because the women, uh, on the other hand, they were there for their domestic value, for cleaning and cooking. So, but the men were really, you know, taken care of for that reason. Uh, mortality rate. According to a 2012 study, nearly 14 million died of the flu in India. The burning huts and burial grounds were literally swamped with corpses, while even a greater number awaited removal. In Salvador do Mundo village of Goa, there was no place in the cemetery to bury the dead, so they just dumped the bodies on a hill nearby. This huge um, skeleton of this huge pile of skeletons and bones was extremely distressing for the residents. So they collected trunks and then they built a cross at the site as a mark of respect to the dead and that's the cross and how it stands today. Uh, in, the Pacific, uh, in the Pacific Islands, 5% of the Fijian population was wiped out, 47% of the leaders of the London Missionary Society and 65% of Catholic catechists lost their lives. 22% of uh, the population of Western Samoa and 8% of the people of Tonga succumbed to this group. Lessons learned from the past. Until 1918, public health was taken care of by medical officers of health, the Board of Education, and many other temporary and maybe other ad hoc bodies. Uh, this may be one of the reasons for the uneven uh, countermeasures that were adopted by the health officers in different parts of Britain and its colonies. The Ministry of Health came into existence in Britain as a response to the influenza pandemic in 1919. There were no testing facilities and death figures were collected from local newspapers. The study of virology was in a nascent stage and influenza was not a notifiable disease. The absence of vaccines and proper medical facilities left quarantine as the best chance for survival. People wore masks and there was an emphasis on cleanliness and hygiene. 
Now the importance of a funeral and the need to remember our losses. According to a study, the organization of the period surrounding a funeral was important to process the loss. A good funeral helps all people involved in the preparations to look back with satisfaction that they put in their best in the last journey of the loved one. Um, there is this old structure which you can see um, on the left hand side. Uh, this old structure was to be removed to widen the road outside the cemetery in Raya village in South Goa. But in October 2020, people suddenly began flocking to it and praying for the well-being of their loved ones who were recovering from COVID. This structure was actually built to mark the mass burial site for villagers who had died in the Spanish flu a hundred years ago. Now this structure has been restored to its former glory. And on the right hand side, you can see a uh, lady, she's praying to this uh, structure. Dr. Amita, I just sorry have, to interrupt. You have two more minutes. Yes, sir. I just finished the two more minutes. Uh, Excellent. There are many there are many other memorials that have been made for the Spanish flu. One is a plaque that uh, is marking the death of the Samoans, the 8,500 Samoans who died in uh, in the Spanish flu. And this was built in 1930 by the government. And the other, there's a Maori memorial, which was which came up in the 1920s. There are some other memorials that are there uh, in New Zealand. And there is one in the United States, but most of these memorials have been built by, uh, you know, people who have been living there, uh, residents or, uh, you know, uh, people who were touched by it. Uh, carrying the past to the present, on the 6th of November uh, 2019, the, the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic memorial class was unveiled. And um, it was unveiled by the New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Ms. Arden, and uh, a professor, Jeffrey Wright. And the second plaque, which is a longer plaque, it, it, it reads, this disaster shaped modern approaches to managing infectious diseases, helping to protect future generations. A memorial site offers not, not only offers people space to pay homage and relive past memories, but it also serves as a reminder for future generations that pandemics keep recurring. It offers many learning experiences for the people and the state for the future. Public memorials reflect the psychological and sociological requirements of societies at large. These requirements include human rights representing the victims, social commemoration rights for the victims, and preserving history. It carries the past to the present and increases the cultural richness of a society. The failure of most governments to commemorate the Spanish flu pandemic silenced the death of millions of people, many of whom may ha must have been disproportionately impacted by virtue of their gender or socioeconomic status. Thank you. So thank you for a very detailed look at the tragedies of past pandemics and the less lessons to be learned in future. And I believe this was another unique topic in this conference. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, and I believe our final speaker, is Jared Gillis from the Reunion Islands. Um, you see me? Yes, it's good. Yes, we can see you and we can hear you as well. Yes, but... Um, uh, thank you for uh, Mrs. Farzana and his, uh, his team to, for the invitation to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, I have a PowerPoint. I don't... I see you, but I can't... Uh... Ah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, my presentation is about a little of no history facts. Uh, South Pacific Islander at Iranian Island. It is an unusual story by the place of the and the country concerned, and by the number of indentured workers. Uh, I want to talk to you about the human traffic between small island Solomon and Gilbert Islands, and another small other island, 
euh, la Réunion. I say human traffic, but uh, in 1856, the traders use the term engagé in French, in untoward workers in English. For the traders, South Pacific Islanders was not human being. They was considered, considered as cattle. As cattle, they could have a name, but they were not in family links. It was really the negation of their humanity. They are not registered in kinship links, family links. When they die, as African, Chinese, Malagashi, Comorian workers at the Reunion Island, they don't have mother, they don't have father. They are PME, père, mère, inconnu. In English, father and mother are Agnon. For the Indians, Indian world workers in Reunion Island, it was often different. It's not the similar story. They touched the pen. This is a solution that the captain of the Sutton found in 1857 to validate the capture of the native from Solomon and Gilbert Islands. This act made in front of a delegate of the French government, Mr. Dalman, allowed to act the recruitment of 60 sea men and women of these islands to work in the sugarcane fields of Reunion Island, an island located more than 11,000 kilometers. It's necessary to wonder about the interest of such a small number of workers recruited in such distant places. Some data allow us to clarify the context. In Reunion Island, the slavery of Africans, Malagashi, Indians, and Creoles was abolished in 1848. Very many freedmen then left the plantation. The problem of arms, <laughs> uh, not the heads, the arms, for work in the sugar factories then appears for the owners. Between 1848 and 1860, Reunion will no longer be able to recruit contract workers or slaves, neither on the African coast, neither in Madagascar, neither in India, except in small quantities. And this due to the hostility of the colonial or local powers governing this country, in particular, England and Portugal. During these years, in France, the political will be will is to colonize or increase colonization very diverse areas, Alger, Algeria, Caledonia, Polynesia, or Indochina. For this purpose, the government wish to have docile workers foreign to the territories and trained in the former colony. Through various archives. We know the exact route of this ship authorized to recruit South Pacific Islanders. A lawsuit before the courts of Mauritius after the delivery of workers to Reunion Island specifies the travel condition, the atmosphere, the behavior of each other. Above all, the conditions for the capture of workers are specified for each island in the South Pacific. The main organizer of this deportation are well known. Mr. Joubert, Franco-Australian, trader and industrialist, played a major role in this story. Mr. Chateau, Franco-Mauritian, is a complex character present in Australia, Paris, Réunion Island, and Mauritius. He will organize the trafficking in human beings. He is a real new slave trader. But these two men, only use the possibilities offered by complicit government to carry out their actions. The attitude of justice, mainly in Mauritius, is rather lax, and it is only through the pressure exerted by the Australian newspaper that this story will be revealed. In Reunion Island, the silence will be total, both on the part of the governor and the media. This communication is based 
on the research work of Dorothy Scheinberg and Karen Speedy. They were interested in the case of the Sutton and both conclude their writings by noting the ignorance of the fate of the 66 Polynesian and by the need for further research. By using the archive of Reunion Island, as well as those of France or London, we were able to discover what became of these 66 people. A letter addressed to Mr. Chateau in October 26, 1856, signed by the governor of the interior of Reunion Island, allows the date, the start of the project. The administration authorizes you to attempt the introduction to reunion of workers recruited for the island of the Pacific Ocean. In October 30, 31, 1857, the report from Mr. Dalmine, delegate about the Sutton, allow us to specify the role played by the French state and by the governor of Reunion in the validation, but also the dupes from the start on the feasibility and honesty of this recruitment. According to Dorothy Schoenberg and London Archives, Mr. Mindo, one of the Westerners embarked in Bayonne as an interpreter, say, complained to the American consul of Mauritius and tried to institute proceeding against the captain Woodson. In search of redress for his own grievance, Ferrier, another Westerner embarked in Byron, petitioned William Stevenson, the governor of Mauritius, on 8 December 1857, in the course of which he related the whole story of the Sutton's voyage. In January 1858, Stevenson sent a letter enclosing the deposition to the governor of Réunion, asking for an explanation. The fundamental question for this man was whether the Gilberts were British possessions or not. The fundamental difference between a slave and an indentured worker lies in the existence of a royal contract and in, it is in its acceptance. The slave is captured, deported definitively without being asked for his opinion, he is only cut off for the traders. The indentured worker knowingly signs a contract of which he understands the terms, duration, time, natural work, place of work, etc. In the case of the South Pacific Islanders, it is obvious that they understand only a few words of the interpreter, that they were led to believe that it was about 10 months work in the neighboring Iceland for harvesting copra. They are totally unaware that they are going to live for a period of at least five years to work the sugarcane in an island 11,000 kilometers away. When they touch the captain's pen, it only makes sense for the captain and the French delegate. The judicial records show the fraudulent character of the captain's action. Mr. Chateau's project involved the recruitment of 300 South Pacific Islanders on two occasions. However, there will only be one trip with only 66 workers. This made it possible that no South Pacific Islander died during this long journey. The food and water were planned for a much larger number. This project was not very serious and will end in a financial debacle. This action through a truly a slave trade ended with the death of the 66 Islanders shortly after their arrival on Réunion Island. We must also remember the revolt about the Sutton of at least two people who were abandoned by the captain on an island several hundred kilometers from the place of capture. Finally, the presence on board the boat of a dozen captured women is very poorly informed 
and justified. It's a very long crossing, 11,000 kilometers, four months of sea travel. A first stopover on July 4, 1857, in the Fiji island, where it will be impossible to recruit any worker. After the boat went to Gilbert Island and arrived on the island of Byron, he took on board six natives, including a woman, as well as two white men, uh, beachcomber. On August 13, the boat arrived in Beru and around 20 people embarked on the promise of a contract existing 10 or 12 months. The next day, the boat headed for Clark Island, where he recruited 13 or 14 workers. The Sutton then aids for the Solomon Island, which it will reach after six days of navigation. The ship then aids for Torres Strait. He stopped at Sabre Island, but it will be impossible to recruit any native. This will be the last stopover before the long crossing of the Indian Ocean for almost two months. What have they become? Arrived at Reunion Island, there is a curiosity for sauvage. They are described as follows. Their lime soaking air was of a yellow tint. Their heads appeared to be covered with a sheepskin cap. The women were not lacking in a certain booty. Spread over a few Sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. You have two more minutes. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> but, um, at Reunion, the distribution of workers uh, are on three properties. And we can see here uh, properties of Portai in the uh, southwest uh, of uh, Reunion Island. There was 180 uh, in Indians near uh, 80 Malgash, 166 African, and th this day, 10 Caledonians. It's a name sometimes say uh, Polynesian Caledonian. Uh, These this people from when, from wor working the copra, but they cutting the sugar cane, and it was, it were, uh, anthropological shock. Sorry. Uh, melancholy, distress, death. It is the fate of these uh, people. We have a register of the uh, death, for the death of these people. They say, they are said uh, Polynesian. Yeah, we have a table with a name, uh, the age, the function, the, the work, uh, the date of the death, the, the owner, and the commune for this uh, 66 people. Uh, the name uh, we, we have, uh, sorry, <laughs> the surname indicates uh, those written by the French uh, employers as they were understood. In the south, in the statistic of the governor of Union Island, we can see these people are said uh, to be from the Gilbert and Solomon Island, and they were classified with African, here we are Indian, here we are African. Here we find a relevant distinction between Indian trade workers. Uh, if Indian peoples and those fraudulently captured are treated as slaves, African, Malagashi, Comorians, and South Pacific Islanders. On November 1958, the French Minister of Algeria and the Colony ordered the Governor of Réunion to stop the recruitment of Polynesian immigrants. There were too many problems political problem with England and moral problem because it looked too much like, like the slave trade. 
After the end of this immigration for the Pacific, the question of available arms will always remain important for the colonial society. It will first consider the transfer of Kanak to Reunion Island to civilize them. Then it will be considered to deport the Indians already used to working in Reunion Island to go to work in Algeria. Then after the South Pacific Islanders deported to Reunion, the same process will take place in Peru. Human trafficking in the Pacific Ocean area will increase. If Reunion Island was a pioneer for the human trafficking, many others will continue this process. It seems obvious to us that from 1862, the deportation to Peru or the practice of blackbirding was equivalent practice to the detriment of the South Pacific Islander. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your presentation. You have covered, uh, covered such a lot of ground, especially interesting for us in the Pacific region is the human trafficking of Pacific Islanders to Reunion Island. Now, I don't suppose many people in our region know about this history. And, uh, you know, such a treasure trove of documents you presented today. Thank you once again. Thank you. Okay, so that was our final speaker today, or at least for this session. A sincere thanks to all our speakers for their great presentations. And our understanding is much more enhanced because of the work you have put in your research and in your presentation today. And um, we will now turn to questions and answers. If there are any questions anyone wants to put to the speakers, you're welcome to do so for the next five, 10 minutes. Okay, it seems like we have no questions, so we will call another, yet another very interesting session to an end. It was a great pleasure having you today. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, oh, please. Oh. Okay, sorry, just hang on. We have one question. Hang on, everyone. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, this go ahead. question is yeah, Mansra Ramphal, Trinidad and Tobago. The question comment is directed to Mr. Selvan Naidu. Thank you, as usual, Selvan, for a very interesting and very informative presentation. Child labor was exploited throughout the British colonies, uh, including in the Atlantic, the Caribbean. And we have to understand the impact of that on our society even today, because these children were denied education, right? Which was the tool for mobility, certainly in the West Indies, they were not given the education, and as a result, they remain in a vicious circle of poverty, which impacted and encircled their children in turn and their grandchildren today, right? And that's a circle of poverty. Uh, some of my uncles uh, worked as child laborers in the Paragras gang in uh, uh, forest, um, Forest Park Estate, and this happened just as in South Africa into the 1950s and 1960s. Um, I'm not very clear. I heard something you mentioned about a child being thrown overboard from a ship. Uh, could you just remind me what was the reason for that? And I may have a comment on it. Thank you, Selvan. Okay, thank you, Mansraj, for the comment. Uh, just firstly, your comment on education is very true here in South Africa as well, up to 1960 um, and up to the 70s, you know, uh, the only university that was open to Indians exclusively and prior to that, uh, the only the elite could go to universities was, it was the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, the University of uh, Durban Westville, which uh, many of the Indians went to, I myself went to it in the 1990s, um, opened in 1974. So, you know, the access to education and being stuck in a vortex of poverty existed for a very, very long time. And as you saw with the 1946 pictures 
uh, the, the fight for education secondary schools was championed by the Natal Indian Congress, which became very radical by the 1945 period. Um, they used the passive resistance campaign um, to highlight the plight of Indians in the Union of South Africa at that particular time. Um, but the, the, the Natal Indian Congress became much more radical and broke away from the trader-led um, Natal Indian Congress of the previous years. There, were, there was the split between the mod moderates and the radicals, the radicals being Monty Naika and um, Yusuf Dadu, who led the, led the passive resistance campaign of 1946. But just to speak to you about uh, the, the case of uh, Munyama, and, and that's, that's a case that's highlighted in terms of the indentured um, uh, documents. And it was also cited by Professor Vyad and uh, Desai in their seminal book, uh, Inside Indenture, uh, in 2010. So that case speaks to this child of 16 year old who was recorded as committing suicide thrown overboard um, on the official uh, captain's log. But there were further investigations mm -hmm. and the testimony, testimony of um, a fellow passenger, he was actually um, uh, sort of in union with this girl. And remember unions were formed on board so that they could go to specific uh, places and also a sense of security for the younger girls. There's no um, information regarding this girl, whether she was um, uh, alone or whether she um, came on uh, with a parent, but she was thought to have been loose uh, in, in terms of morals. And that was highlighted by the sailors. Um, but the testimony of the passenger says that she was um, uh, raped by the, by the sailors and thrown overboard. And clearly this is a case of the abuse that uh, was endured by the indentured uh, workers um, on these voyages. And this is one, one particular case. So I hope I've answered your question there, Mansraj. Yes, thank you very much, Selvan. And rape was a very common occurrence on the ships uh, across the Atlantic. And those are well recorded in terms of the journals and so on that um, the surgeons and they would have written and whatnot. Sometimes the surgeons themselves were the rapists, you know. So there are plenty, there are lots of um, commonalities in the unhappy experience of our women on board ship. Thank you very much, Selvan. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for any of the panelists? Okay, if not, then this session is now ended. Thank you so much, all the presenters.